The entire diet bowed deeply. The emperor reached the rostrum, returned their bows, and moved to the microphone. He was wearing a dark, high-necked naval uniform. The uniform was stripped of all badges of rank except for his Order of Merit First Class, a bright swirling badge sewn onto his left chest. The diet took its seats, and Hirohito began speaking. It is important that we should discuss our coming responsibilities under the new situation that has arisen, he began. Last night I brought my closest advisers to the palace shrine. We announced the end of the war to the ancestors and to the sun goddess. The new era has begun, but it does not end the old and we must conduct ourselves in a manner that will bring credit to the sacrifices of those who went before us. The Diet sat rapt and attentive, for the quiet message carried with it an immense strength. We must remember that our country accepted a termination of hostilities based on certain understandings, continued Hirohito. We expect that all sides, including the Japanese people, will live up to those understandings. We have faith in our people and know that they should abide peacefully by the terms of the Potsdam Declaration, just as the other side will be careful in its enforcement. Then it will be possible for us to rebuild in all areas and to keep our national structure. I marveled at the indirect power of the message he was sending. Again, he had not mentioned the word surrender, and by asking the Japanese people to respect the Potsdam Declaration, he was also reminding the Americans that they had guaranteed that the imperial system would remain intact. In effect, he was giving MacArthur a warning. If the Americans did not live up to their guarantee, he had the power to ensure that the Japanese people might not act so peacefully in the future. The emperor now held a piece of paper in front of him. I have written a poem for our people, he announced. The diet whispered with an excited anticipation, for here would come the emperor's true message. It was common practice for members of the aristocracy to communicate their sincerest emotions through such thirty-one-syllable tanka. And then the emperor began to read. Courageous the pine that does not change in color under winter snow. Truly the men of Japan should be a forest of pines. The members of the Diet stood and bowed deeply to the Emperor. They knew exactly what he meant. They were the forest of pines. The western occupiers were the winter snow, bringing a temporary whiteness upon their branches. But spring would come, and after that the summer, the snow would melt away, and the forest of pines, stronger and more eternal, would still remain. The emperor returned their bows, then without further comment shuffled slowly out of the room. And now the prime minister, said Lord Privy Seal Cadeau, after the emperor had gone, we must discuss later what he says, yes? If you wish, Lord Privy Seal. Prince Higashikuni, the emperor's uncle, now walked to the podium and bowed. He had been prime minister only since Japan's surrender. I knew from Willoughby that Higashikuni was in many ways the opposite of Hirohito. The Sybaritic prince was known for fast cars, French mistresses, and an addiction to intrigue. In the 1930s, he had been involved in a campaign of terror against moderates who were opposed to Japan's continued expansionism. It was believed that Hirohito had convinced his reluctant uncle to become the first peace government prime minister because of Higashikuni's influence over those who still opposed surrender. Without Higashikuni, the extremist factions might have begun a palace intrigue designed to subvert the emperor's decision to end the war. Not that Higashikuni seemed in the mood to cooperate. He brought with him to the podium an air of boldness that bordered on arrogance. He surveyed the seated members of the Diet with an expression that did not conceal his great bitterness, and the Prince wasted no time inventing that emotion. And so it has come to this, began Prince Higashikuni. As he looked out toward the Diet, I felt him staring directly at me. 
Today, 100,000 foreign soldiers are occupying our sacred soil. More will come. Throughout the world, commentators are now saying that Japan was wrong to have taken territory in other countries. Morally wrong, they are saying. The Prime Minister surveyed his fellow aristocrats with an expression that told them he believed this was all absurd. But what of the conduct of these same nations who now celebrate our defeat? Yes, we seized territory in a ruined China, but did not Great Britain and even Portugal precede us. After all, who was it that ruined China with their opium trade and forced concessions? Yes, we took Singapore and Malaya, but from whom? Not the Singaporeans, not the Malayans, but the British. Yes, we took Indochina, but did we take it from the Vietnamese, Cambodians, or Laotians? No, we took it from the French. We did not take the Philippines from the Filipinos, but from the Americans, who themselves less than 50 years ago took the Philippines from the Spanish. It was our sacred mission to retake Asian territory in the name of Asia, Higashikuni continued, to free it from the white man's rule. Several in the diet squirmed in their seats, cringing as the prince remembered their old objective so baldly. Seeing this, he scoffed. Higashikuni seemed to seethe with resentment as he went on. A new and unfair concept is upon us. It threatens to label our honored leaders with the term war criminal simply because they carried out policies that have been a part of international behavior throughout history. Is it an international crime to take territory by force? If so, who convicted the British, French, Dutch, and American leaders after they took the territories we recently liberated? No one. They congratulated each other and competed to take even more territory. And what is different with Japan? Nothing. We do not accept that our leaders have conducted themselves as criminals. We will never accept this concept. The members of the Diet nodded slowly, but many of their faces were confused. The war was lost. Shame was upon them. MacArthur had been given unilateral powers. Japan had signed the document. What more was there to accept or reject? Murmurs and whispers coursed across the Diet floor as Prince Higashikuni stepped away from the podium. Kido tapped my shoulder his face bright with a smiling intensity that masked an obvious concern. We should speak now, said the Lord Privy Seal. Would you come with me?